Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Today is episode 79, which starts a two-part series of interviews with Diane Butterfield. Now, Diane Butterfield is a mother of six children, grandmother of 26, and a resident of Fruits Heights, Utah. She graduated from the University of Utah in psychology with a certificate in social work. But her story, well, you'll have to stay tuned. It's pretty crazy. A couple of things that she's worked on just um, for some social accolades here. After the automobile death of a woman in her neighborhood, she spent several years working with the media and UDOT, which is the Utah Department of Transportation, and the legislature, which resulted in some of the first traffic lights on Highway 89 in Farmington and Fruits Heights, Kaysville, and Layton area. This is a, a section of Northern Utah where she lived. She helped bring about and design the Cherry Hill Interchange and the Pedestrian Skywalk and was honored at the ribbon cutting for all of her work there. And she worked with Congressman Jim Hansen to gain $7 million in funding for additional highway improvements. So she's done a lot of social work in helping keep the roads safe and keep people safe. And as you will see in her story, there's a little bit of irony in that. I've given this story two episodes because it's long, it's intense, and around every corner there's another twist to the plot, another funeral, another dragon to be slayed, another something serious to be overcome, another heart to heal. If you've ever thought life was not fair, well, you're in good company with today's interviewee. On her fridge, there's a sign that says, fair is something you go to in the fall. But one thing Diane is clear about is that while she is not in charge of what happens to her, she is totally in charge of how she gets to act and react. Stay tuned for the story. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. Diane Butterfield, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Thank you. We are really excited to have you on. And your story starts out with meeting the love of your life getting engaged within a couple of weeks, being excited to start a family. And after five years, you can correct me on any of this if I'm, if I'm off, but after five years, still not having children of your own. So you adopted three children, um, some with some health challenges involved. And then miracle of miracles, you had three natural children of your own. Um, do you want to fill in a few of those details before we head into some of the big dragons that you have faced down and how you did that. These are just the happiest of happy times. But we had, after these five long years and waiting forever to adopt, um, did adopt a, a, just an amazing, amazing baby boy who turned out to be an amazing man. And then um, two years later, another son. And, and then um, two years after that, a, a daughter with lots and lots of birth defects and we just had a lot of challenges with all three children through those years. I quit counting at about 30 hospitalizations and surgeries between me and my children. And it was just a very, very busy time. And we were so happy because we had our family and then surprise, pregnant after 12 years. And then again and again. So, um, you know, you're right. Three adopted and three homemade. You say all of that so nonchalantly, oh, 30 visits to the hospital, and I mean, that's huge. That alone, I'm sure, is a story of trial and difficulty and heartache all, all by itself. That's, that's huge. It, it was. It really was at the time, and in looking back, figuring out how to survive all of that, and with a husband who was traveling for work and really just doing most of this on my own with the help of some dear, very dear friends and neighbors, it kind of helped get me ready for what was ahead. I mean, how, how do you survive that? Well, somehow we all find a way and it comes in handy because that's generally some of the easier times of our lives. Well, and now the plot thickens because for those listening in, we are saying that things get even rougher than that. And 
it's hard to get rougher than that because those kind of medical issues with children, with people you love that you care about, the cost, the the cost to watch them suffer or have difficulties. I mean, that is huge stuff. So the fact that your story gets even more intense just takes us to a whole different level. Why don't we go there? Tell us what happens next in your story. Well, I I guess kind of the best place to start was with just how dearly, dearly we love all of these children and the last two were born 17 months apart, the, um, the youngest, and we called them the twins. They did everything together and just absolutely the delight and light of the whole family and the neighborhood. And they were just, there was just something extraordinary, truly extra about these, these two littles. And um, uh, we um, had a home business and uh, we're working from the home business and uh, most of my kids were um, at Lagoon, a local amusement park, for the day. And my husband and I were going to drive to Evanston, Wyoming, about an hour and a half at the most away, just to run an errand uh, where he wanted to pick up some hunting equipment and come back. And so the little girls were going to go with this. I'd never really just sent my kids off before, but my older children um, were with a lot of neighbors that we left and trusted. And anyway, the girls wanted to go to Lagoon and it's like, no, 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 you're going with us to Wyoming. And um, it was so interesting. They, the words came clearly into my head, take them to Wyoming. And I said, no, you're coming with us. And just these cute little blonde faces, mommy, mommy, we would, we want to go. And, and, um, and again, the words came, take them to Wyoming. And I said, no, you're, you're coming with us. And about that time, um, a friend, an employee, her daughter um, popped in to the office at our home uh, just to say hi to her mom. And she heard the girls begging to go to the amusement park. And she said, well, I'll take them. And in my brain, it's like, that's not happening. I mean, 16 year old driver and all of that. And I just always been so cautious with my kids. My kids would wear, this was in the days before bike helmets and nobody ever wore helmets skiing, but my kids, I made them wear hockey helmets to do those things. <laughs> always so careful and and uh, anyway this gal's mom said look she's got grandpa's car it's a big boat with a car and it's only two miles away and I knew this girl had just driven the family down to Baja California I mean um, actually down to Mexico and back and had plenty of experience and and my girls were just so cute at begging and I I relented even after I had her take them to Wyoming a third time and um, so I put sunscreen on their cute little faces, and I even knew it in that moment. I enjoyed every moment of touching these beautiful little faces and smoothing sunscreen over and over across the bridge of their noses and on their cheeks and, and watch them just skip out the door, the happiest, you know, of little girls. I'm sure people can tend to see where this story is going, but it turned out to be what I thought would be the last moment with those girls. And I found out later it, it wasn't, and that's part of the story too. But my friend, um, Jackie, I let her take my car home because her daughter had just taken her car and with the girls. And, and so they were off and the house was quiet and it was so rare because we had employees there and I was just loving it. And the doorbell rang and two girls who used to tag team baby tend to my children because it always took two to watch these kids. They were all handful. Uh, happened to come by. And again, they didn't just, I, mean, I found out later, just didn't happen to come by. They had had an extraordinary trip in Europe and had wanted to talk to me about it for months, but they, they came by. And during their visit, the phone rang and my friend Jackie was on the phone so upset. And she said something about a car and something about her dad and could I come to her home? And I, I said, of course. Well, I didn't have a ride except for these two girls that had just happened to come by. They took me to my former neighborhood. And when we drove into the street, it was, I don't know how to explain it, but time had stopped. There were police cars all up and down the street. The neighbors were all out on their lawns visiting with each other. And as I approached Jackie's house, it was like everything just froze. And I knew I was there to help her. I thought maybe her father had been killed in a car accident. I didn't know what was happening. And I was generally pretty good at being 
there for other people. And I was happy to be here for her in any way I could. And when I got out of the car, she came up to me and said, Diane, our girls are gone. All three girls are gone. And they, they had been, uh, she told me they had been hit head on in, in front of the frontage road in front of the amusement park. And of course, my immediate reaction was just like, no, 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 this can't be. And then it hit me that her daughter had been driving. And I realized in a flash, I think it was a blessing, that at that moment, I had a choice in how I was going to respond, what I was going to say and do. And I could have ended up destroying two families at that moment, and, but it just hit me, and the words that flowed out of my wa- mouth were, no blame, no fault finding. I could just see this anguish and grief in her soul as I was feeling for the loss of my daughters, and how can anyone hurt more than that? And I didn't want to do anything to add to it. And we went into her home, and, and the, um, the sheriff's department began giving us a few details. And when I hear this, it, I'm so sad. I'm so melancholy. And the, you know, the first time you told me this story, I broke down and cried. I'm sorry, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> so the kids were driving and they were hit head on. I guess the, there was a truck driver who was texting or looked down or crossed the center line just for a moment. And I guess there wasn't much left of the little car they were in, or the girls, and you didn't really get to see them, did you? No, no. Well, when I was able to. So this was probably even pre-texting days, but just with whatever distraction was going on, the driver just barely crossed the center double yellow line and was met um, head on with a a semi-truck cab who had another cab on the back, uh, piggyback. And apparently the scene was so horrific and so traumatic uh, with, with what it had done to the bodies of these little girls that, that, um, that the sheriffs um, there, many of them had to receive professional help to, to try and help them cope with what happened. So the wow. driver was instantly gone. My Sarah, the eight, they, they were seven and eight years old. Sarah, the eight-year-old, was instantly gone. And I never was able to see her again. And they life flighted uh, Missy to Primary Children's Hospital. And we were able to see her. And it was, it was um, hard to imagine that there was such life and such vibrance and such joy skipping down the front steps of my home. And then everything changed forever. And... The person that conducted the mortuary, a dear friend from my neighborhood, no matter how much I begged and pleaded, would not allow me to see my Sarah. And I know that it was done out of love, but, you know, I, I, never, I never saw her again. And so, you know, it, this was also very sudden and so unexpected. The ripple effects of that are interesting. Everybody involved trying to collect my children from Lagoon, you know, trying to get them back to my home. Um, were They all were saying things like, if only, you know, I had stopped and talked to them longer when I saw them. Mm. If, if only, you know, my an older um, sister of theirs was leaving with them in the parking lot and a friend came by and because the whole neighborhood was at Lagoon that day and she says, oh, don't go. Come stay with us. She blames herself. If only I had stayed with them. And I said, sweetheart, you could have gone too. And she said, mommy, that would have been just fine. Mm-hmm. It's just so sad to miss her sisters. So it's easy to get into the if only for oh, sure. Yes. I think it's the would haves, the could haves, and the should haves that can drag you down when you have enough to deal with keeping on keeping on so 
Well, and there's a certain, you know, as this story unfolds, and you can tell us there's a miraculous experience with you tracking down your husband and him, you being able to find him and bring him in and let him know what was going on. But also this tendency, you know, as the story unfolds to see that God is aware of what's happening, that stones are laid in the path for the path that we need to walk. And all of the what ifs and the if onlys don't necessarily have so much sway when you realize that. Well, I know how to put it. I yeah. never was in charge in the first place. There you go. <laughs> that was just an illusion. <laughs> you know, my life plan has had to change so many times and I finally figured it out. I'm really not so much in charge of what happens to me, but I am totally in charge of how I choose to act and react. Well put, well put. And, so, and that comes just, you know, in story terms of every day, whatever happens to us or, you know, whatever is going on in our story, we get to create the stories about it. And if the stories we create are a focus on the what ifs or if only I had, if, if those are the stories we create, then we deal in a space of a lot of regret and fear and and those aren't the stories that are healthy for us in moving forward and being positive and those are stories that get us stuck not the healthy way of dealing with our life stories so and and i feel like that's one of the things that we're here to learn from you and your story what does that look like how do you actively choose your responses to really difficult life situations part of this comes from having years before read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he was a Holocaust survivor. You're probably familiar with the book. Most people are. So I came to appreciate things I'd heard in church and from my own life experiences that regardless of my circumstances, I have not lost my ability to choose my own way. What happens to me cannot, unless I allow it, dictate my reactions. And so that has saved me even though it's hard, even though it's horrible, even though it's a struggle, even though it doesn't hurt any less, it has saved me many times in my life to realize. And so because I was familiar with that concept, because I'd had practice it, with it in my life before, when, when this dear mom whose daughter had just been killed and my daughters were in her car, and you know, it was, it was easy to understand that there was a choice to be made, and it was no blame. Just love for her and her situation, and grief at our joint situations. My children, to kind of pick up the story, were taken back to my home by friends and neighbors, and I was still at uh, Jackie's home and had to make the phone call and talk to my 16-year-old son, the oldest, so that he would know what in the world was going on. No one had told them what was happening, and they all knew it was something horrible. And I had to ask him to please tell his younger siblings that they had just lost their baby sisters. And, and he is a tender soul, and it was just a weighty thing to have to ask. But I didn't want them to have to suffer with the unknown longer than necessary. And I finally got home about five or ten minutes later. And, and when we walked in the house, I, I realized my husband's not home. He had gone hiking up to a very tall mountain peak nearby called Francis Peak, trying to get ready for a, a fitness endurance run. And I had begged him to take our dog with us, and, and he didn't want to. He was afraid of rattlesnakes and, and such, and it might slow his progress down. And, you know, love my husband, but I could never really tell him what to do. He was an independent soul. Somehow that day he agreed, and he took, the, took Cherry, our just amazingly bright, super obedient dog, a, a blue heater healer border collie mix, very intelligent and very protective of our family. Well, so my home was filled with 30, 40 people, and, and my husband's not there. The hospital is calling because they would allow us for a short period of time to come and see Melissa, and uh, I didn't want to leave without him. And so we didn't know what to do. And and I, I finally turned to the bishop of our church and said, could we just pray that he will turn around and come home? That was all we could do. And so this large group of people just joined together in the most sincere prayer I think I've ever participated in, begging with God, please let him come back. 
to us. Let him turn around. Now my husband's so determined. I knew that it would take a miracle straight from heaven <laughs> to get him to stop and to turn around and come home. I don't know how much later, but he came in the door as soaked as if he had just gotten out of a swimming pool. And what had happened is the neighbors had started up the canyon with whistles and calling his name and, and they couldn't catch up with him. But, but our dog Cherry had started, my husband Keith later told me, he said, it's like a scene out of Lassie. She just started barking, barking, barking at me, and she refused to take one more step up the canyon, not one. And she would bark at him, and he would have to go down and try and drag her up the canyon, try and get her to move. And again, she was so obedient, especially to him, and she would not do it. She would just run farther and farther down the canyon and begin barking at him. And as upset as he was about having to change his plans, he had no choice but to turn around and start down the canyon where he soon met up with friends and neighbors who gave him this most devastating news. So he, he made it back home, and it wasn't until later when we were able to figure out timelines and such, but it was the very moment we prayed that he would turn around and come home that Cherry refused to take one more step up the canyon. It really was a miracle. Nothing else could have done it. in the depths of beyond imaginable grief, because we used to look at each other and say, oh, what would we ever do without these girls? We couldn't imagine it either. And you can't imagine what you would do or how you would get through it. It's because you don't have the need, so you don't have to use the skills, the tools, the prayers, the fight, the effort. You don't have what it takes until you need it. We didn't know how how we could get along without them. What were the tools that you used most? What were the things that really helped you through this? Deal with uh, it. I think the fact, the rec- recognition of the fact that that uh, God was aware of us. I mean, somehow he got the word to Cherry. Isn't yeah. that amazing that when we can't when we can't necessarily hear that, you know, that he would use an animal and that he he just works in such miraculous ways. There's always a way. Well, they're probably a little bit more in touch than we are sometimes. Right? Uh, to, and to everything, of course. Yes, yes. I mean, the word didn't get through for Keith to stay home or for me to say don't go, but he was able to get through to Cherry and have Keith come back to us. And he was able to go with us to the hospital for that last visit with Missy. And, and it was really hard because not being able, able to see Sarah again And of course, it was a joint funeral, and and so we needed a closed casket for Sarah, and so we had, you know, double closed caskets, because we did everything alike for those two girls, you know, Mm -hmm. just wouldn't be fair to Mm -hmm. (laughs) do it any other other way. But, But knowing that as hard as this was, I had a choice. I had a choice in how I was going to do this, and and I just decided that there's no easy way. I didn't decide that. It was it was just painfully true, but it could be done with maybe as much grace as possible. So what did you do on a daily basis to make that happen? Well, at first I just tried to keep breathing. I mean, that's all, that's all there is, right? That's all there is because truly, literally at the moment and for many moments, many days, many weeks after, but especially that day, I literally, just could have stopped breathing. I, it was a choice. I had to force myself to keep breathing. It would have been so much easier to just stop. I had an experience with a therapist once that I was going through something that was really difficult and painful. And so as I was speaking with a therapist one day, she looks at me and she said, can you make it through the next minute? And I said, yeah, I can make it through the next minute. And she said, okay, and can you make it through the next five minutes? And I said, yeah, I can make it through the next five minutes. And then she said, well, can you make it through one more day? And I said, yeah, I can make it through one more day. And she says, just take it one day at a time. Mm. And that's powerful because when you're in the middle of something, you don't know that's possible. Well, and you sometimes don't want it to be, you know, when the pain is so overwhelming that you don't want to move and you don't want to wake up, 
and you don't want to exist, then one minute at a time is all you can do. Yeah. I'm sorry you understand that, but, uh, but <laughs> look at what has happened to you because you found what was needed to keep going. And until, unless we have some of these experiences, not that I'm choosing to have them, but you don't have what it takes, but somehow you have to find a way. And, and that way can be a little bit different for each person. Yeah, it's, it's a, a very personal journey. Yes, yes. But some of the basics are there. And I think that it's knowing there's something more important than me out there. Because for me, I could have quit breathing, but not for my children, not mm -hmm. for my husband. I had to choose to keep going. I knew that what had happened mattered enough to, the, to God that he talked to my dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's in looking back that we can see things that were placed in the way that were helpful like the former uh, babysitters showing up when I most desperately needed a ride when my husband was able to come back. And the, I, in looking back at some of the rest of my story, it's very similar things that in looking back, I can see that things were placed there to be of help at the very moment that I needed it. You know, sometimes it is those little things that often, you know, they're small, but they're miraculous. And because they're miraculous, you know you're not alone. And because you know you're not alone, you can keep going. Yes, exactly. So Diane, when you were telling me the story of those tender moments with your girls before you sent them off and you were lovingly putting that sunscreen on their noses, you alluded to the fact that there was something in hindsight you recognized of the time and the care and the attention that you're putting that this was some kind of a goodbye. Um, how, how did you know that or what, what, was, what was influencing that now that you look back? And you know, I think that's the key part. It's really sometimes only in looking back that we can recognize things for what they are. And I had two similar experiences with them. One was putting on that, you know, that, those tender moments with them were really unusual and really savored and treasured. And then looking back and thinking that that was a tender goodbye, that was a tender mercy to me, that at that moment, somehow my soul knew to just love every moment of that experience, which I did. But it still left me feeling, how could the whole universe come to the screeching halt that it did when my daughters died? And I mean, life literally stops. And after a while, you get annoyed because the world seems to keep going on for everyone else, and how could it possibly? But I just couldn't reconcile myself with the fact that such a horrific thing could have occurred, and I wasn't aware of it. Because I had been home for some hours before I was able to find out what had happened. And I thought, how, how could this, horrible ripple in the universe have happened and I was not aware and again it was a story of only later my becoming aware as I had mentioned before my husband wanted to run an errand up to Wyoming and we chose not to take the girls and on our way back down the canyon I had an amazing experience just this calm quiet and then overwhelming I can't give proper words to it, but a complete feeling of love surrounded me and just filled my, every part of me. It was something I've never experienced before, and I've never experienced since. And I remember looking over at my husband, looking at him and loving him, and this is, this is different than anything I had experienced before. And, and I told him I loved him, and those moments lasted for, I don't know, three, four minutes, but the, where it was intense and profound. So you're driving with your husband while you're, you believe Honor. that your girls are in Lagoon, right? Yeah. right? Yes, yes. We're thinking everything's fine and we're just coming home from an errand and that literally out of the blue comes this overwhelming feeling. And, and at this point, we didn't know anything that was going on. Mm-hmm. And, and this, this feeling of just profound, profound love. So where and did that come from? What do you think it was? 
I didn't realize what it was until, again, in looking back a couple weeks later, um, the mom of the um, other girl that died in the accident, her daughter, her mom, of course, was working for us, and she came across a gas receipt. And she said, look, this is the day our girls died. And as we looked at the gas receipt, and we could see the time stamp on the receipt, and we knew we got gas as we got, there used to be a gas station out of the canyon. And, and we were able to, both of us together, clearly see that that experience I had had 10 minutes before we left the canyon was exactly the moment of the accident. So that was, that was your girls? That it was my girls. Just the feeling of gratitude that I really did have a real goodbye. That somehow my mother's heart was aware. I didn't know what it was at the time. But somehow my mother's heart was aware that they loved me and they know, you know, that I love their dad and I love them. But we had that moment together because otherwise I was just watching these cute little girls skip down, you know, the front sidewalk, never to be seen again. And um, I did have that very, very tender mercy, that loving opportunity of knowing that somehow I was in touch enough to feel. Well, and that they came, that they came, Diane, they came to say goodbye to you. Yes, yes. And, and I, I am just, like I said, I'm so grateful. I know that this isn't the common experience that people have. Sure. But it was something that had weighed on me to think that this really, um, huge tragedy it affected you know the whole community and and beyond and that this could have happened and how could I not know so it gave me some personal peace mm -hmm. in looking back that somehow I did know see the, these moments as I interview and talk with people like I'm thinking of the Annie Schmidt interview right now and her mom having that one interaction in episode two where she's driving up the Columbia River Gorge and says, Annie, isn't this beautiful? And then Annie speaks back to her from, you know, Annie's, Annie's dead and she hears Annie's voice say, yeah, mom, isn't it wonderful? I knew you would love it. And that, that as a mother, having some communication with your child after they've gone, I imagine from your heart, just being able to know that they're happy and that there's that sense of love and that it's something positive from them moving forward through their eternal journey, that that is beautiful. What, what a tender mercy. It was. And to hear that in the, in the, the episode with Annie's mom, mm -hmm. you know, just, uh, just touched me so much to, to again, remind me, these are my daughters. That was her daughter. And they're gone, but we are still connected. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. As I have the opportunity to speak with and listen to the life stories of the amazing people who come on my podcast, I often feel a sense of reverence. Diane Butterfield's story brings up this reverence in me. It's just getting started this week, and you might think it couldn't get more intense, but it does. And in next week's episode, we'll finish her tale. But I leave you with her quote to think on again. Quote, I'm not in charge of what happens to me, but I'm totally in charge of how I get to act or react. Unquote. Your challenge for this week is to think about that, to think about how that affects your own life, um, where that might plug in, and how you can gain strength from that idea in the challenges that you're dealing with right now. Join us next week as we watch this hero's journey continue. And of course, there's always go to the website, www.loveyourstorypodcast.com. You can comment on this episode if you like. You can sign up for the 21 Day Challenge, which is a structured challenge. Every day for 21 days, you get a challenge in your email box that 
introduces you to a life hack that you get to implement for that day. Fantastic fun stuff. The people who are involved in it are having a great time. These life hacks help you build a better life story, a life story with more possibility, with more love, with more connection, with things that um, you're probably not already structuring into your life. Or if you are, they, they'll add dimension for you. So go to the website and sign up for that. Get started. We'll see you next week for the second half. <laughs>